presentation will be probably you know less technical because it's gonna involve um, how to make the archaeological community part of the process of addressing quality of data. Uh, so kind of peer review and I'll pass through a secret case study to develop you know some ideas. Um, so let me start with this study by Ariane about the different success of linked open data in heritage management and academic archaeology. And among the questions uh, they Ariane identified, there are, of course, diverse organizational settings. So, for example, in heritage management and institutions like museums, uh, the uh, dissemination of the content, the creation of links between artifacts in one collection or the other, it's part of their agenda. In academic archaeology, actually it's quite different. Usually academic archaeology focuses most on individual projects rather than developing you know, institutional perspectives. Uh, there is its mother of fact that at the end in academic archaeology there's a low level of open sharing uh, research data which is due in part of licensing agreements that we have when we're running projects, and on the other hand, on a perceived possible loss of control on the data itself, which is connected with the data quality problem. So on one hand, uh, the idea is that once data are open and are linked, we lose control on it, with a risk of a decrease in terms of, of the quality. And on the other hand, I think that one of the problems is that once they are open, they are completely open to scrutiny. And I guess that somehow it's working as a deterrent for scholars to make data open and linked, so well searchable and errors well spotable. Um, uh, are we afraid of our own mistakes? Yeah, yes, we are, because we are human beings. And as scholars, we are, you know, particularly involved in this point. As there is no rewarding mechanism for producing linked open data, no credit system, it's not recognized as a pro value when you're applying for a job, why we should do this? Why don't we you know, keep adopting the same rule? Let's keep things swept under the rug and it's over. And I guess in my opinion, probably to increase the production of linked open data in academic archaeology, we should be decriminalized. Errors, uncertainties, and our lack of precision. Uh, I'm not saying that we should underestimate it because it, it's playing a massive part in our research, but we should reconsider what does it mean, error and, and mistake. First of all, it's not about trusting other scholars. It rather concerns the degree of indecision and a bit of subjectivity that every interpretation contains. Several studies have in fact demonstrated that even specialists do not always agree upon simple questions like apologizing artifacts or dating artifacts. Secondly, our understanding of material culture, typological and chronological issues, it developed over time thanks to the collection of many more artifacts or the performance of target types of analysis. Our technical equipment from field devices to lab instruments have consistently developed in few decades, providing the possibility to get more accurate data. And I would like to provide you an example. I said my case study is going to be Cyprus. That Cyprus, the archaeological framework of historical, prehistorical and historical periods in Cyprus was developed by these guys, the Swedish Cyprus expedition, which in the late 20s, early 30s, undertook a massive series of excavation in the north of the island with the aim of providing a chronological a complete sequence in terms of stratigraphic data and material culture. But one of the points is that they dug mainly cemeteries located in the north part of the island, that's the green line dividing the north and the south, and after the Turkish invasion of 1974, the archaeological focus, of course, shifted in the south, and that period it was a terra incognita. So all the framework, like typologies of material culture, the chronology of material culture, developed in the north, had to face the problem to be adaptable to the south. 
and it transformed uh, the, 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 the idea of error and certainty. Just to give an example, these were, it's, uh, it was identified in a site in the north. It is considered still today as a diagnostic ware for the passage from the late Chalcolithic to the early Iron Age. But as its chronological and typological framework was developed only uh, according to the material evidence of that site, during time, that ware was recorded in many, many more sites, and this changed so much, not only the typology, but the um, dating power of this ware. So, for example, Jenny Webb and Dave Frankel developed uh, quite recently a study saying that it's true that that ware is dating to that phase, the passage between the late Chalcolithic and the early Iron Age. But at the end, this massive collection of data over time, it changed so much our idea so that now we, got, we can date that where from the late middle Chalcolithic because of the excavation of Kissonerga to the end of the early Cypriot III with the excavation of Marquis. So my point is that, was it a mistake to date to date that where to the passage between late Chalcolithic and early Cypriot where before the excavation of Kissonerga and Marquis. No, it wasn't. Is it a mistake to that that were to only this phase here today, now that we have this evidence and this evidence, it is a mistake to do it today. So the point is that probably we should shift from the under the carpet logic to the three musketeers logic, thinking about that it is a collective responsibility to address data quality. It's not about you know, pointing the fingers about colleagues and what they did over time. It's about adding information as we're collecting information on the field. So we should add information in our databases and especially in our linked data. Um, what, what's quality in linked open data? We have two types of qualities. One, you know, it's, it's a bit of a series of problems collected with the link structure of linked open data. And the other one, it's more uh, focused on the content of our archaeological evidence. So just to be very, very quick, general problems with documentation, domain registry, data description, policy, data provenience, the maintenance of data sets, and there's a massive bibliography about quality schemes, how to address this topic. That's recent data that says that 70% of the linked open data present problems in terms of times and part. I'm gonna find more on whoa, the content-based perspective. I, I'm, I'm not a technician, I, I'm a landscape archeologist, so I'm gonna focus on sites which are the point of my research. In terms of content-based errors, mistakes, uncertainties, problems, we do have problems with specific knowledge, problems with chronological uncertainty, problems with spatial uncertainty, with the artifacts assemblage, with the technical equipment that have collected data, with incomplete data sets, conflicting data sets, uh, redundant data sets, and again, massive bibliography about quality schemes and metrics for evaluating the quality of data. Uh, when we're dealing with our projects, uh, so we, with the data sets that we generate, we have, oh, I missed, we have a kind of internal agenda. We have some rules, some professional rules that we use to follow, to produce our data as more complete, correct, accurate, consistent, and well structured. When it's about linked open data, we know that one of the main points, it is to reach the five stars goal. So both in terms of con the content-based perspective and the linked-based perspective, we are well equipped for our own projects. When it's about dealing with other people's data sets, it's more complicated. I'm a land landscape archeologist, so in my research, I usually I have the outcome of the results for different projects undertaken back in time. And there are many factors affecting our perception of the quality of this legacy data set. It's about the nature and the characteristic of the support if they've been published, unpublished, raw data disposition, the quality and the clarity of the metadata. 
the different adopted methodologies and theoretical backgrounds, the different adopted typologies, nomenclature, standards, and ontologies, and this is directly connected with the length open data we own, the uh, quality and the characteristics of the data repositories, and a bit of human error and knowledge. So, uh, my point is that there are the, there's a literature about, especially in landscape studies, dealing with legacy data, uh, data about how to quantify and process data metrics, especially in terms of chronological uncertainty, but also on locational uncertainty. And there's a tradition in terms of the participatory process of peer reviewing our data. Uh, this is, well, it's not working. This is the well, concept, well known conceptual framework by Fisher about the uncertainty in spatial data, which includes error, vagueness, and ambiguity. So, well defined objects, categories, typologized, or poorly defined objects. And this introduced the sets of techniques to measure and quantify errors from heuristic analysis to Bayesian methods to fuzzy logic. What I would like to focus on now is the participatory process of you know, providing peer review of data, which is not so much exploited in archaeology. Uh, it's part, for example, it, it's a strategy uh, used in the interactive open access publishing, mostly in sciences or in medicine. That's an example of the workflow of the Journal of Atmospheric Chemistry and Physics, where papers are taken online for eight months and they're completely open for the scientific community to provide their peer review comments and uh, uh, notes. And uh, after this period, the, the paper is again rechecked by the author and then published. And what's interesting is that the outcome of this phase of peer review it remains linked directly to the paper so that you can trace back the process of increasing and checking the quality. Actually, in, in uh, and these are um, the, the, the main uh, uh, benefits that Porsche mentioned, but anyway, in archaeology, the Journal of Open Archaeology Data in, in LOD, it has a phase of peer review and the attention is stressed on uh, the data set description, the repository location, and the reuse potential. So the evaluation of the quality of the data sets, uh, it's addressed and reviewed, open the context as the same process, and a process of post-publication post, post peer review, where a set of scholars uh, um, review the data sets, uh, defining the quali quality and the intelligibility. I started thinking about these topics uh, uh, for writing the application for, to get funding for a project, uh, which hopefully we get the funds, for creating um, a platform, an online platform, including a WebGIS and WebGL database, structure according to linked open data, but, so uh, the archaeological um, data sets uh, uh, included in the platform will come from these two districts in Cyprus, which are very, very rich in terms of archaeological heritage. So, and several, you see several um, survey projects has been operated on the island. The idea how, on how to run this platform is to, not only to adopt the ETL process, but to include, at the end, a phase of post-publication participatory review, which has to be open to scholars in order to make them be part of the evaluation of the quality of data. And at the same time, this process should be, <coughs> become again part of the data itself. So it should be a process of changing and refining the quality uh, step by step when participants and scholars want to provide the review of data. Um, of course, when it's about uh, reviewing, so how to work with the review of peer review of the data sets, in this case, the different uh, projects can be linked as different LOD data sets connected one with the others according to the framework, the traditional framework. And under this point of view, 
what, the, the way that the Journal of Open Archaeology um, data and open contact work, it's absolutely great. My point is that to shift the attention to a process of peer review of the en entities. So being a landscape archaeologist, in my mind, the identities are the sites, the polygons, or the, or the dots on the maps. So anyway, I started wondering about this, this problem when I was uh, doing my PhD in Glasgow. One of the main problems, for instance, was the spatial accuracy of data. Just to give you an idea, uh, uh, um, in Cyprus, this, the, the sites have been located in space using very, very different um, uh, accuracy. So from just the mention of the toponyms uh, to the use of differential GPS. So it, it varies the accuracy of the location so much, especially this part here, which is the vast majority of the sites was recorded this way. So when I was doing my PhD, I just defined some you know, random categories which work with the Cypriot data sets and it permitted me not only to visualize in the GIS the area of more you know, accurate spatial distribution, like here, or area where the data sets were more less accurate and reliable. And of course, thinking about this kind of estimation in uh, a statistical type of um, effort. It was more complicated with chronology, uh, and just to give you an example, this is one site uh, in, in the southwest of Cyprus. So I, I tried to think about how to evaluate the quality of uh, uh, the chronological attributions that scholars which have been surviving or writing about this site have provided. And I made an experiment. I asked the three colleagues to do what I did during my PhD with, with a sample of 10 uh, sites. So I collected everything that was published and all including the reports of the different surveys that had uh, surveyed the site. So this is the su a survey of 1978. This is a very, very recent gazetteer. I collected also, you know, particular attention with the material assemblage find. In this case, one of the surveyors of the 70s gave me his notes. So anyway, I gave all this material, especially very diagnostic uh, pottery, so the images, and the material assemblage, I gave uh, this material to my three colleagues and asked them, do you think that the chronological attribution that has been defined for that site, is it correct, is it incorrect, is it possible, is it likely? During my PhD, I defined some categories. Of course, they're arbitrary and they work for this uh, data set. So from you know, incorrect values, which means it would be absolutely no sense to date that site to that period, two correct categories based on you know, presence of radiocarbon dates and assemblage of very, very diagnostic artifacts. And that's the outcome. So every one of the reviewers, oh, there's a mistake, uh, suggested if it's from incorrect to correct to date this site on the different peers according to what has been published, which means that, for example, for the three reviewers, it would be incorrect to date the site to the early Cypriot. With increasing values of reliability of the chronological attribution, period by period, based on what's published, so to all the pictures and papers I gave them. And this is, can be represented also on the GIS, you see, as people, uh, as period or more credibility or less uh, reliability for that chronology. I did the same during my PhD. Oh, can you move it? Okay. I did the same in my PhD, just to show you how it works in time. So the settlement pattern under this point of view can be interpreted both in terms of you know, the distribution of sites and the credibility, it's stuck. And the credibility and the chronological reliability period by period. Although it's the DPI of the pictures. <coughs> Are you the move? Anyway, that, that's the point. It's not working. 
And one of the points, for, ex for example, is that this kind of approach may help us in spotting period of less reliability, like for those sites here, because they're the outcome of a particular type of project with a particular, you know, um, uh, reduced knowledge about the characterization of the material assemblage dated to that period. So now it's working. So anyway, th this kind of participated approach could work for chronology, spatial location, function, and whatever. Okay. So just to summarize the main point and to arrive to the final point, which is not about replacing what method with the other, is just to include the archaeological community within the process of reviewing data, which should be open and interactive, because new data can increase <coughs> the quality of old data, or I mean our capacity of assessing their quality. And the main uh, benefits of uh, uh, direct feedback, information density and quality assurance, dissemination of free speech, but at the end to reinforce a sense of belonging and community, so avoid that pointing the finger against uh, someone else's error. Thanks.